Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's event. How intellectual property creates value for your business. My name is Zoe, and I will be the host for today. Today's event is co-organized by CAS International Network Limited and NBS Intellectual Sundra Bahad. CAS International is a network of accounting and consulting firms serving a wide range of clients. We have partner firms in Asia countries, namely Hong Kong, Singapore, Indonesia, and etc. NBS Intellectual Sundra Bahad is Malaysia leading intellectual property firm specializing in the legal protection of IP and the enforcement for more than 20 years. We will be covering two topics today. The first session is about trademark and copyright, while the second session we will learn more about pattern and industrial design. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Mr. Anthony Tay, Senior Legal Advisor, who will be covering the first session, and Dr. Marcus Chi, Pattern Executive, will be covering the second session. Both of them are from NBS Intellectual. I will now pass over the control to you, Anthony. Is, am I in control now? Yes. All right. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so it's uh, thank you for this opportunity here to be a presenter and speaker here today to talk about some basic idea about intellectual property. Um, uh, maybe uh, uh, some of you all may type in the uh, in the chat below uh, later on uh, if you have any questions about trademarks and uh, copyrights. And because uh, today's talk will be more likely on touching on the basic surface of uh, intellectual property, I will not go deep into the legal perspective from the uh, from the side of the intellectual property side, but I will more touch on more of the non-legal view where businessman and a layperson would feel they have doubts on the uh, intellectual property such as trademarks and copyrights and what are the consequences and what are the requirements and criteria for registering a copyright and a trademark here in Malaysia itself. I will slightly touch on some case study as well for overseas, but not in depth because the today's scope will be focused mainly in Malaysia itself. Um, so without uh, wasting uh, everybody's time, I will now share uh, my presentation today. All right. Uh, some, uh, can somebody please nudge me if uh, uh, everybody can see the slide or someone is lagging and cannot see the slide or if I'm going too fast, please, please nudge me. Okay. So, um, to, to give everybody a basic idea, I put a real life example of an iPhone here and a single particular product of an iPhone consists of majorly four major intellectual property involved. So the first one is the industrial design, which is on the outlook and lay layout of a product or invention itself. We also call this known as design patterns in some, some countries, but in Malaysia, we call it as uh, industrial design. We also have copyright, which is on the, uh, the artwork, the, the wallpaper itself, the art itself involved for involving in a uh, product. Uh, it can be the brochure, the literary work of the brochure, or in, in terms of the, uh, the artwork which put the design or the powder product is being presented in market that's the copyright that will be involving a copyright we also have the technology involved in the product and that will be an invention and we will protect it under patents will be covered by my colleague later and lastly we have the my main topic of today which is a trademark which is on the logo and the branding itself so here are the four basic intellectual property which everybody should clearly distinguish between one another because uh, Malaysian SMEs and Malaysian who is not really that uh, familiar with intellectual property tend to confuse between the four of them, uh, especially between copyright and trademark. So uh, I have mentioned earlier, I will touch again, the two, uh, scope of today's topic will be on trademarks, which I will go through the types of the trademark, the criteria of a trademark and the importance of the trademark. Copyrights I will go through on uh, similarly the type, the criteria and whether registration or protection is required to be recognized in Malaysia. And also some case studies, I will put in some real life situations, examples. And last but not least, I will uh, go through how it impacts uh, your businesses and uh, where, and its priorities in, uh, in terms of your business perspective. 
So what is a trademark? Uh, to those who has touched, uh, who have filed the registration before, would ought to know that the trademark is basically a way for one party to distinguish themselves from another and identify and distinguish the goods from a single proprietor or seller to those of another, and uh, whereby it grand purpose is to indicate the source of origin it basically shows that the brand itself or the logo itself so once a logo or, or a brand is legally registered it will formally if you're formally known as a trademark so uh the types there are several types of trademarks being the word the very simple one is the word or wordable mark uh, you can be in stylized or in plain wording as you're seeing on the screen we also have some other types of word mark is in uh single letter or single numeral but do bear in mind that single letter and single numeral trademark are non-distinctive by nature so uh if you were to tend or intend to register such a trademark in such a nature it will most likely be rejected by the uh, registry however there are some exceptions uh whereby when once the particular trademark is being recognized or well known has been substantially used or substantially stylized or designed then it may be potentially be registered uh, I show some example here, which is the single letter M from McDonald's and the P letter from Pinterest. These are substantially well-known trademark and has been put to use for quite a substantial period of time. Hence, it is possible to be registered. Also, we have some two numerals and double letters. Uh, could, the same principles should apply. Uh, it is considered non-distinctive by nature by the registry unless substantially stylized. As you can see, I put in a few examples on the screen. We also have some figurative trademark, which is very straightforward. Basically, it say, states that, that it's a graphic. It has no word element involved. It's basically just a graphic to show that the trademark is in uh, figurative elements. So figurative elements tend to be more, uh, more distinctive in comparison to a verbal mark. We do have combined mark, which is a combination of a word and a device. We also have some taglines and slogans, but do bear in mind that tagline and slogan in Malaysia is uh, relatively difficult to obtain registration if the particular tagline is very uh, relatively new, uh, because majority of the Malaysian SME they tend to uh, use marketing phrases rather than taglines. If you can see on screen, most of the taglines here are relatively remote to uh, remote and indirect towards to what they are selling or promoting by their business. So here, uh, we under, uh, I'm not sure everyone is aware, but since 2009, uh, 2019, there's a new law being passed by the government, by the parliament, which is a trademark act 2019, which repealed our old act of the 1970s, 1976 uh, trademarks act, uh, whereby they introduced two new non-traditional trademark here in Malaysia, which is a sound mark and color mark. So for the sound mark is basically, um, they registering a, a, a voice or sound or tone from a particular trademark. I have put an uh, uh, example here, which is uh, from Hisamisu Pharmaceutical Co. Incorporate. Uh, it's a, basically the sound of, I think everybody will familiar in the uh, Hisamisu song over the sound of four musical tone like Hisamisu. I think everybody will be very familiar with this particular sound. And we also have the color mark followed by Astro, which is they call it as the magenta and along with the color code. Uh, from the Penton Color Formula Guide. So a color mark is also permissible to be filed under the particular new law here in Malaysia. However, I do have to warn everyone here, if you intend to go for a color mark, try not to go for a single color because as long as the single color is not really owned by a particular company and is not being created by a particular company, then it, it is most likely being rejected at first unless you can show substantial evidence that the color has been being used by you for a very long time and you have been you have created a color and that may potentially help assist your case but however if you are not really that particular original owner or creator of the color my advice is to not to refrain from following a single color mark it, it is best to go for a multi-color tone mark if you intend to file protect your color we also have 3D mark, which is under the new law. Uh, you can see the Toblerone chocolate, the shape of the chocolate is a 3D mark, which uh, before the pass of this, uh, the new law, uh, shape of a mark or shape of a particular uh, entity or the brand would be protected under the industry design part. But uh, due to its insufficient and uh, short term of protection, the 3D mark was introduced in Malaysia Hence, uh, now the 3D mark will enjoy the same 
lengthy protection and uh, same protection rights granted towards trademark. Okay, now we need to go through the criteria of a trademark whereby uh, the public will need to know what is unregisterable, what is the unre what is unregistered trademark looks like here in Malaysia. So we do have a regulation now 2019 as well, along with the new act. So under the regulation four, here are some of the criteria whereby it should not be in a trademark if you were to file it for registration. The first one being a registration indication. Uh, this is basically shows that the R in circle, I think everybody will feel very familiar. If your mark contains the R in circle symbol in your trademark, it is best to be removed to avoid any obvious action later on. We also have the national flower. The national flower is cannot be presented or present in your trademark application. Otherwise, it will also face a rejection under the absolute grounds. We also have honorifics like uh, Dato, uh, Yang Dipaton, Agong, all those honorifics granted by, uh, by the authority in Malaysia cannot be pre exist or presented in your trademark. We also have some government or state buildings or any imitations also cannot be presented. We also have the ASEAN or any related imitation. Red Crescent and Geneva Cross, I believe this is the most common uh, element found in a trademark here in found by Malaysia, especially towards the healthcare line. And, uh, in, in the midst of pandemic, we face a lot of uh, clients been throwing application at us with a Red Cross or a Red Crescent. And these are usually really, really sensitive subject in, the, uh, in front before the registry. So it is best not to present your mark in such a manner. Now, um, what is a registrable trademark? So a registered trademark, as I mentioned a lot of time in my in my in my earlier in earlier in my earlier slides, I have mentioned the word distinctive. So what is distinctive? Distinctive basically means in a layman terms means special. As long as the mark is special without any substantial meaning or any direct meaning towards the product or services, it is called no, considered distinctive. Distinctive could also be obtained by way of usage. I will go through that later on. Um, Obvious reference, because under the old law, the old law mentions the, uh, the word direct reference, but it has been repealed and the stating that giving an indication or references towards the goods or services itself, the word direct has been removed from the act. Hence, I have replaced the word direct into obvious, uh, which can be derived from the act. It's basically saying that if, you, if your mark consists of reference, or it's obviously referring to the goods or services you are actually selling, that means there is obvious reference, which will result in an absolute, in a refusal from the absolute grounds. You need to explain to the registry that why is your trademark referring to your goods and services in such an obvious manner. We also have, of course, it's a, it's a given. Your mark should not be causing a confusion or deception amongst the public. Confusion and deception would arise if your mark is coincidentally cited with a famous uh, actor's name or a famous uh, element or famous um, brand from overseas, despite whether they are being registered or not in Malaysia, because it shows that you have the intention to copy someone else's mark from overseas, even though they are not being used in Malaysia, um, because Malaysia is the member of the Paris Convention. So, all of these they will be taken into account by the registry, whereby they will be very thorough in their examination to ensure that famous marks are protected here in Malaysia. Also, the last but not least is offensive and scandalous element. Uh, everybody in Malaysia knows that um, the racial issue is, a, is, an, is an issue here, and so your trademark should not com uh, possess or contain offensive and scandalous uh, element in the trademark. A very good example would be the word uh, babi. Everybody knows that this word is very offensive towards the, uh, the, Malay, the Malay race. So hence, this word should not be presented in your trademark. Not to mention the uh, majority of the examiner in the in the registry are Malay. So this word would appear as offensive and scandalous to them. So this is just a word of advice of my, from my personal point of view. And once all of these particular elements are fulfilled, a trademark is protected for 10 years indefinitely, uh, provided you are being uh, the trademark is being renewed every 10 years. So in, a, in other words, the trademark is actually lasted forever because everyone from your, uh, from your undertaking, even your successor, can help assist you to renew for your own. Okay, I mentioned special or unique just uh, earlier on. 
And these are the four particular things I would like to touch on in relation to what constitute a distinctive trademark. Special or unique is very straightforward. Basically, your mark is very special, whereby upon perception, the mark is totally out of this world unique and nobody else would tend to or even attempt to use the particular trademark. And usually it's uh, would be a mark which has no meaning until one is given or provided. I'll give you some examples here. Facebook and Instagram, all of, even though this particular, all of, uh, these two trademark has a meaning in if you dissect it part by part, but upon its combination or combined together, it actually derives a new meaning towards, uh, towards the particular word. If you put, go back to the years before Facebook and Instagram were in existence, Nobody would even know that Facebook and Instagram would be this uh, would be a famous social media platform now. So um, these two particular mark could con I am considering these two particular mark as fulfill all the criteria for a valid registrable trademark, which fulfill the distinctiveness test. Okay. Uh, to go on to an, um, the obvious reference part, no obvious reference means no association. It will trigger a cognitive process within the mind of the consumer. So for example, Apple Inc. and Al, the moment you perceive these two trademarks, the first Apple, so you need to throw everything out you know about Apple Inc. Before uh, Apple is, uh, everybody know Apple is a fruit, nobody would immediately associate Apple to uh, electronic devices. That is a very that is a very unique thing it, because it provides no direct association or no obvious references towards the product they sell. The next one, to, uh, the next to it is the Owl product. Um, Owl product is a shop that sells uh, spectacles and glasses and shades. So Owl itself is an animal. And if you do not explain further by the proprietor, nobody will know that it is a shop which sells spectacle. So he, hence it is a it is actually a mark which triggers the cognitive process of the minds of the consumer into thinking what is actually these two brand selling. Uh, the more, when I explain it this way, you need to think that the, this two particular trademark is a newly created trademark. But in order to make a more clear example, I need to use some relatively well-known mark here in Malaysia. So that is the explanation of between the obvious reference. And skillful illusion. Uh, in Malaysia, there, even though it's not really expressly stated in the Trademarks Act, but skillful illusion is allowed, um, provided your trademark is uh, contains this is particular elements where the a trademark contains the references, but it's not really that obvious, whereby it tells the consumer or buyer directly what the things is actually all about. A good example would be the web pampers baby dry. So in relation to the skillful illusion part would be the baby dry word. The baby dry is actually a registered EU trademark, whereby initially the, the trademark was rejected by the EU uh, IPO, but subsequently it explained and it got registered under the grounds of skillful illusion. The what, the explanation by the, the council uh, representing Pampers was, uh, the, the owner has used this baby dry. It's not basically referring to the Pampers because everybody know Pampers is made out of paper, or even cloth at most. But what baby dry, I'm not selling baby. I'm basically telling the consumer, if you use my product, I will have the ability to ensure your baby will stay dry throughout the day, which is a skillful illusion towards the purpose of the product itself, not directly towards the product, but towards the purpose. In such a circumstances, this particular trademark can be accepted for registration. We also have a, has a tagline here, where dust can't fly. Upon perception from the word, we wouldn't know what is actually selling. But uh, you all can take a guess before I go to the next slide. But wet dust can fly actually refers to the product, a vacuum cleaner. So how the vacuum cleaner is the number one promoting uh, promotion uh, taglines here in, in the particular uh, brochure. So a wet dust can fly is basically selling a vacuum, is basically telling the buyer that uh, the, the function of the vacuum is to dampen the dust so that it, it cannot it cannot fly up the moment you dust everybody knows that when you sapu or you're trying to clean your room, house with a broom the dust tend to fly up even you switch off the fan but with this particular vacuum machine they will dampen the dust and dampen the any um debris on the on the ground whereby it cannot cause it won't fly up because it's dampened so hence they put up the tagline where dust can fly it makes you clean more easier this is why it's a skillful illusion and this particular tagline can be registered. I hope I didn't lost anyone in my presentation so far. Um, 
So the last part for is about confusion and deception. So I mentioned earlier, if your mark is identical or confusingly similar with a previously registered mark in Malaysia or in the registry or in the database, then it will 100% of the time will be re rejected at first. Or your brand is being coincidentally clashed with a famous brand. And even though despite this unregistered here in Malaysia, it will also be rejected at first. And th this entire thing is actually very subjective. So um, sometimes the registry tend to do a very thorough search on the unregistered, unregistered part, but sometimes they do tend to give you a, a reason which is uh, ridiculous at first because I do face a lot of ridiculous trademark because uh, clients, some clients, they tend to use two companies into, regis into registering a trademark. So these two company registration will tend to conflict each other. So um, for, um, it is a very subjective matter in, uh, in terms of confusion and discussion because there are a lot of circumstances which need to take into consideration because Malaysia is a Commonwealth country. We do have case laws and common law here which also need to be considered on top of the Trademark Act. So if a trademark were to be refused by due to this particular relative ground or ground was confusion and deception, we can, it can be, it is arguable and rebuttable, provided uh, there are some evidence provided by the respective owner. And we can use a lot of different kinds of case law to support the owner. One of the, one of the very, one of the common grounds we will support if your mark were to be cited with this particular uh, criteria will be, will be used to uh, honest concurrent use uh, defense. Provided you are able to prove that you have pre, you have your application is your usage is able to predate whatever is being used to cite your own application by the registry. So a good example here will be Panasonic and Panasonic, which I'm very sure everybody here who have heard about this particular issue. But to ensure to assure that nobody else is lost, why I show this particular example here is because I would have to go through the case again. So this particular case is uh, actually very old. Um, for some of you all, maybe you would know that Panasonic previously is known as National and not Panasonic. And before National transformed into Pan, uh, before National transformed into Panasonic, uh, Panasonic is already in existence in Malaysia, which is from Penang. So the moment Panasonic filed the tra trademark registration, it was opposed by Panasonic. And however, the opposition uh, has failed because Panasonic fails to show that Prior to Panasonic existence, Panasonic is already in existence because everybody knows Panasonic at that time is known as National and not Panasonic. So Panasonic is considered a new mark trying to oppose an old mark. So the opposition failed. And one of the reasons provided by the Panasonic um, owner is that Panasonic is not an obvious imitation of Panasonic. It's actually the PEN stands for Penang and Sonic stands for sound. And Panasonic sells majority of them are sounding system and speakers, microphones, all those electronic stuff. So it actually comes to a meaning that I am trying to register a sound from Penang, which is really distinct towards me and none other. Hence why the, re the, re the reasoning itself is actually valid. So it's also accepted by the registry. And hence, you can see two particular, two of this brand here in Malaysia, You, add, which is why sometimes we buy Panasonic try not to purchase the wrong product if you want trying to buy a Panasonic. And also we have the McDonald and McCurry issue here in Malaysia, which will go on for uh, the war of uh, the litigation war of eight years. I'm not sure everybody's aware of, but uh, the gist of the, of the study, the case study is basically McCurry has been operating a mama store in Star Hill in Kuala Lumpur. And McDonald's sued McCurry for using the, the initial MC. Um, however, even though McCurry initially lost at the high court, but McCurry appealed to the court of appeal, which subsequently prevailed in their eight, prevailed over their eight years battle. Um, why? The reasoning given by the court of appeal is the high court should not judge the particular matter on a face value and, and without any further so, uh, consideration towards the surrounding circumstances. Uh, the few circumstances mentioned by the court is um, McDonald's. Yes, McDonald's is very, very famous, very distinctive. But is the word MC or the letter Mac really only distinct or really owned, monopolized by the McDonald's here in Malaysia? So the court say that MC is actually a relatively um, common surname in a Scottish in the Scotland or by a Scottish. So hence MC ought not to be monopolized by any single proprietor. That's the first. 
And the second reasoning given by McCurry is a mama store and McDonald is a fast food store. And the target audience would be relatively different. And the moment you walk into McCurry, you wouldn't have asked for a McChicken. And the vice versa, you walk into McDonald's, you wouldn't have asked for a roti canai or nasi lemak. Even though McDonald's now has nasi lemak burger, but that, that's, that is not the issue there. So the issue here is you wouldn't confuse between these two particular trademark. Not to mention they are very distinct of their own. And plus, McCurry has been operating in Sahih for quite some time. So it is a bit unfair for them to sue McCurry out of, on the basis of simply on the word MC, which is, which is not monopolized by McDonald's alone here in Malaysia. And hence, this particular case is the only FMB battle that has won by a non-McDonald's non or non-unauthorized entity or proprietor by McDonald's. This is the only case. This is not by all means giving you a green card to go, oh, by all means use the word Mac to promote your food product. Uh, this is not what I'm trying to tell you. This is basically trying to show you that there are surrounding circumstances in terms of judging whether there are actual deception or actual confusion, all right? Oh, I have just stated that. I mean, I just skip this slide, yeah? Okay. So what is the importance of a trademark? The benefit of a trademark actually grants you a national protection. Why I use national protection here? Because um, trademark is a, not only trademark, uh, all intellectual properties are actually uh, territorial basis, <clears throat> whereby you need to register in a particular country in order to enjoy protection in that particular country. So no registration equals no protection in foreign countries. And hence, this is one of the benefits why a trademark must be registered, regardless of whether you have used it for a very long time or not in Malaysia. It also gives you the proof of ownership and grants you the absolute rights to the exclusion of others. Uh, I'm not trying to exclude that non-unregistered mark rights don't have any rights, but it is very difficult for unregistered mark to prove ownership rather than a simple registration with a certificate to prove the ownership. Um, unregistered mark, you can enjoy protection under the tort, the law of tort for under the passing off, but it is not ex it is very, very um, trivial, um, not very trivial. It is very, it's a very lengthy process in order to prove that you are the actual owner rather than using a single certificate alone. And hence, the proof of ownership is one of the benefits for registering a trademark. Also, it also grants you convenience in terms of licensing, franchising, right, selling, and assigning, and transferring. Because the moment you register it, you can actually easier to transfer it to another person, or sell it to another person, or trying to rent it out to another person. So it actually give you assurance to any interested parties who are seeking to rent or to buy your trademark. It also boosts your value in terms of uh, if you intend to go public listing, intellectual property portfolio is one of the considerations for go listing. Oh, uh, one thing which is new in Malaysia, which I did not mentioned in my slide is uh, registered intellectual property can also be used as a collateral for bank, uh, for bank financial support. So it's also one of the key major thing why there are now more and more proprietors tend to register a trademark, uh, regardless of their size in terms of business. So how do we protect our trademark? Um, there are two, you, two ways in order to protect our trademark. One is the continued usage of the mark under the unregistered way, under the common law protection. But as I mentioned, it's a very lengthy, it's a lengthy process and it's a very subjective matter, which we have a lot of things to consider. We all have, and the other one is the application of registration, which is the statutory protection under the act. So the moment you register, you can enjoy using the word R in circle. Do bear in mind that before you obtain a valid registration, the R in circle is absolutely prohibited. You cannot use the R in circle unless your trademark is registered. And hence, if you intend to use any symbol to symbolize the wall mark is actually intend to be used as a trademark, then you can even use the symbol TM rather than the R. It is an offense, by the way, if you use the R in circle without registration under the act, and the, the, the fine is around 10,000 ringgit. Okay, I have given an example why the importance of a trademark is. Here is a can of a soda drink. Imagine if the world don't have brand or trademark. So everybody will be purchasing a similar thing without knowing its actual content, its actual stuff, and everything sur surrounding around it. So um, a generalized brand without anything on the product may be applicable to some other products like tobacco industry. Maybe those are that uh, have an adverse effect towards our health that you may use a particular thing without any particular branding on it. But however, 
if you moment you put some branding on the product itself, it actually gives you an origin and signify the origin. Where does it come from? So it's actually the primary purpose is to protect someone from confusion. Basically, that is the key importance of a trademark to distinguish, to tell the public which one, which is which. Basically, so um, in order to fulfill what a trademark is all about, a brand, a trademark is very important to protect someone from confusion. Okay, I would like to go through trademark trolls because this also has been faced by our, uh, a problem faced by our client for a very, for a very long time. So here, uh, I would like to go through uh, the importance, when should you know to venture into a foreign market? When? Before venturing into a market, you should ought to be registered, you ought to register a trademark in the particular brand and not after you venture into the market because problem will arise if you do it this way, because you venture into the market and then you have, have some results in the particular market and then only then you're trying to go and register a trademark, but you found out that someone has already registered your trademark or has been using your trademark in the registry and some country practice a first to file, first to get basis. So this particular thing would give you a setback and causes you some financial problem, not only in terms of your expanding problem but also your financial problem you need to spend a lot of money to get it back you need to spend a lot of money to go through administration process uh, administration process and also litigation process just to get the particular trademark back and this has been this issue has very shown very apparent obvious in china itself china is a very classic example of a first to file first to get country so in order to avoid all these kind of things you need to plan your venturing properly before venture into a market so we also have limited unregistered right despite it is available in most countries but because due to the first to file first to get system some of the countries would care less about whether you are famous in overseas or not and some countries even though they recognize usage but they only recognize usage in their own country and not in another country to prove distinctiveness and hence you will see a lot of trademark trolls trolling or actual owner by registering their mark and then sell it back for the sell it back to them for a price this can be seen in a lot of countries who practice the first to file basis so do bear in mind that about the trademark trolls before you're trying to venture into a country and uh, i have gathered some common reason for non registration or attention to a particular trademark which is important by from team mark owners the the common thing is, is i received is that the mark is very new they don't know they don't know it's a certain about its potential and they also not a business for priority because they're trying to expand their business first and registering trademark is not really that that much of my priority and they're also in a trial and error stage where they don't know this brand whether it would work or not and also has some budget issue but however these are all not valid reason if you ask me because registering a trademark is only about which only costs you about one uh, two thousand at most 2000 to 2005 at most it wouldn't cost you much and you enjoy your protection for 10 years um if this is only for trademark which is very distinctive uh -huh. for trademark which is very which you know hits a lot of the the criteria for non-registrable trademark then you may spend a lot more because you need to appeal you need to go to hearing and whatnot and you need to explain to registry why your mark should be registered all those will involve cost but for trademarks which is very distinctive you only need to spend around two to 2005 just to get the mark registered and these are not an issue because when you face an issue, it will be a matter of tens of thousands just to get rid of that issue. You need to go to court. You need to go to a lot of different kinds of authority just to get rid of that particular um, problem. As a result, not available or being misused by another. That's the result here. And last, uh, last plot. And why should you and should you or not appoint an agent or attorney? And this is the part where I'm trying to promote myself. Okay, so um, of course, um, it is actually recommended to get an agent or get an expert in terms of registering trademark because they will provide you a professional search with a report to determine whether there's a conflict between your trademark currently with the registered trademark or file trademark in the database. We also possess the adequate knowledge and procedure, not only in Malaysia, but also overseas. We do uh, get in touch with, we have a lot of affiliated uh, associates in a lot in over the world. So we do have the knowledge and uh, in terms of procedure and the law there. We also identify the types of goods and services for your company, uh, whereby we need to, we will propose the, re the relevant class, the classification, because there are 43 class, there are 43, uh, there are 45 classes 
or trademarks to be registered in, 1 to 34 being the product classification, 35 to 45 being the service classification. This needs to be determined uh, detailedly before you registering a trademark because you wouldn't want to file a trademark under the wrong classification. And you have assurance. So uh, if you have a trademark attorney at your hand, you will have fewer disputes. You have an easier way towards registration. You also have a great chance in succeeding in in terms of dispute rather than you going on your own. Because we do face a lot of clients to trying to save cost. Yes, obviously you go to file, you are able to file your own trademark with the Malaysian registry. But the moment you face an objection, you will lost always whereby you don't know what to do, how to respond to the registry. And then we do face, have a lot of clients that they file their on their own, but at the end of the day, they still get back, come back to us because they are unable to handle the refusal from the registry, which happens quite a lot, by the way. Um, I, I believe there's um, the statistic between a refusal cases in Malaysia is about 70%. Because majority of the time, 70% of the mark will be refused at first because I would say the Malaysian proprietor or the trademark owners, they tend to use trademarks, which is very um, obvious, which is very obvious to what they are trying to do. Unlike some countries, they their trademark is very special, but Malaysian, they tend to use some words or logos or devices, which is very obvious to what they are tell, they are doing. So the when I'm doing search, the moment I look at the mark without even asking, the, the, the client, what we are actually selling, I already know what they are selling. So this is not a good sign, to be frank, okay? So now I have some exercise which uh, for, for you all to do after going through to ensure that you actually understood what I have gone through earlier. So here are some examples of our previous clients. We have Delicious Moment, found on the class 43 for restaurant. We have Pisado, under 20 for furniture. Dr. Motor, for 37 for vehicle repairing. Eco Sun, 37 for construction. Curtain Place, 35 for retailer for curtains. Delight Go, under class 43 for FMB and food and FMB services. BigSale.com.my, class 35 for online platform. So here are some examples of our past previous clients. So I want you to take a moment and go through this each and few trademark, which of this trademark has been refused with finality and our client did not get a registration at the end of the day. So here are a few trademarks. I will reveal the answer in 10 seconds um, to, to not waste anybody's time. So just, uh, I'm not going to ask you for your answer because I have I don't have the opportunity here because even in an actual talk where I'm physically presented in front of the of the public, I can actually look, at, look into them and get an answer, but I'm not able to do it now. So just, uh, keep in your mind and think for yourself which of this particular trademark is actually not good for registration. Okay, so another five seconds, I will go to the next slide. Okay, let me go to the next slide. The one with the uh, the blue, the red thingy on top of the mark are the marks which are not registrable. Pisado, Ecosan, and Delight Go actually is a registered trademark here in Malaysia, but the, the rest of them are not able to uh, obtain registration due to their obvious nature. Delicious moment you are telling, basically you are telling the registry, my restaurant sells delicious food, so hence it is not registrable. Dr. Motor, basically you are telling that you are paying, you're trying to be a doctor to repair motorcycle or, mo or motor related product, hence it is not registrable. Curtain space is even more obvious. You're basically telling the, pub, the registry that you are a place for selling curtains, which is very obvious. BigSale.com.my, you're trying to tell the registry, you're basically having big sales every single day. So it is not registrable as well. So here are some very real life situation idea would pique your understanding. All right, we're going to go through the copyright part. I hope I haven't lost anybody in my presentation so far, but copyright will be a very short one because uh, in order to go through copyright, a lot of case law will need to take into play in order to explain the thing further. However, today is not a law lecture, so I will not go through that in depth in terms of what copyright should uh, be aware, should all aware of. I will go through what owners, whether you do have copyright in your uh, in the midst of your daily course of trade. So here is what copyright is all about. Okay, first I will go through a definition of course. Okay, copyright is, is not trademark you do not copyright a trademark trademark you need to go through registration so copyrights only 
applicable in certain situations. The first one, the, the worst one is being the right to control towards reproduction and publication. Do bear in mind the word in red is repro reproduction and publication, okay? This is the right of control of a particular author. It is a form of protection provided to the author of the original works of authorship. So from the original one, underlined original, you know that the works of authorship is requires to be original and not some derivative work from based on a based on an existing work. So this is the definition. So what does it mean? I know I will I have lost someone there. Okay. Popular protection only extend to an expression of an idea, but not the idea itself. Okay, so the whatever you ex you have in your mind is not protected because that's your idea. Copyright only protect whatever you have been expressed in physical or material form. That is what copyright is protecting, and not the thing in running in your head. Okay, that's what is the definition all about. Give you a more real life situation example. Yeah. Okay, this is you, the hu the the cute little human humanoid figure. Okay, you have an idea. Okay. After some skill and effort, you write a book, or you produce a novel, you produce a movie production, or you came out a manual or for accounting. Everything, this stack of pro this stack of thing is your expression of an of your idea. This is what copyright is protecting, and not the thing, and not the one in your head, which is the light bulb. The light bulb is not protected. Only the stack of books you see in the example is protected. I believe this is very, 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 very apparent what I'm trying to say. And I hope everybody will get what I'm trying to say here. Okay. Okay. Here are the criteria for registrable copyrights. Copyright is actually very easy to get it registered, actually, because uh, it is an automatic rights of protection. The moment it's being, you have put some insufficient effort and you, it is uh, provided is original and not an adaptation of another works. And if you're a qualified person, it's very easy. If you, everybody is qualified here because you're all Malaysian and it's being reduced and fixed in tangible form. The moment you fulfill all these four criteria, the, the, copy, the product, the work itself is protected automatically without even registering. But I will go through whether registering is needed. Is it a requirement? Is it needed, absolutely needed to get it registered here in Malaysia? I will go through that later. So. There are four types of copyright here in Malaysia. They are the artistic work, they are literary work, they are musical work, and the dramatic work, etc. So these four, will, I will call them the big four of copyright. So all types of work created by any author or any artist undoubtedly cannot escape these four. You can be a, has a combination of one or two or three or even all of them, but definitely you cannot escape these four. So. Upon creation, the work itself will enjoy a life a, for a lifelong protection of the author plus a 50 years upon it, he or his or her death. Okay, this is the basic protection right for a copyright work. Then you all may think, what about joint authors or works commissioned by a company or an employer? You are an employee in a company or basically um, you are basically creating something during your, your working hours. So what about this? Does it belongs to me? So I'm sorry to say that. If you are due, you created something during your working hours, or if you are being paid to do something, that particular work is belongs to the company who pays you, or belongs to the person who pays you for it, and not to you. In terms of joint author, the similar things applied to the life of the protection similar applies. Let's say if you have two author, one of them pass away, so the protection will only start running after the passing away of the second author plus another 50 years. So this, uh, and it goes on to third, fourth, and fifth author, no matter, uh, regardless of how many author you have in the single work. Okay, so it runs along that, that type of way. Oh, that's for a joint author. So we also, okay, I mentioned earlier whether there's a, actually a need to register copyright here in Malaysia. So uh, not only in Malaysia, we do have reg copyright registration system in China as well. We also have in, U in the US. And so, or some countries they don't have, like Singapore, for example, they don't have it. Um, but what is the benefit? The benefit includes you get a cert. That, that's that's one of the one of the good stuff. You get a cert for it. And if you want to prove that you are an actual owner of a copyright, uh, similar to an unregistered trademark rights, you need to drag a lot of documentation in order to prove a point. And back in the old days, before a voluntary notification was here, um, 
corporate owner who is smart, they will actually draw, come up with a statutory declaration declaring on the date itself, I have come up with this particular uh, product or this particular work um, titled so-and-so, and then created on this and that date and sealed on this date. And then they get it, not they get it notarized or get it affirmed by commissioner of oath. And they will seal it in the envelope and put it in the safe. And, and that particular envelope should not be opened under any circumstances and when there's a, unless there's a dispute happen. Only then you open the, the sealed envelope in a court of law only by the judge himself. Only then he will know that, okay, on this particular date, you have sealed this date and this thing actually belongs to you. If the date actually predates whatever the other person is actually mentioning, that means you won the case. But that is a very troublesome matter and you also need to drag a lot of documentation and for this voluntary notification, the government actually gives you the benefit of registering your trademark. So with the, reg with the government, like trademark blood, you register your copyright work with the government. Um, the government already will be notified of your work and it will also reduce dispute among co-owners and there's no renewal required. Once it's filed, it belongs to you forever. And it is very, 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 very useful as evidence of enforcement. So the cert itself looks something like this. You get something like this, I think for around thousand something, you get a cert for your copyrighted work. Then why not? By all means, then why not if, to save all the problem in explaining yourself to the uh, to the any potential infringer? I'm actually the I'm a copyright owner. Here is my date and whatnot, whatnot, whatnot. We just flash flash him a cert. Here I registered my copyright. So be gone. Do not use my work anymore. This is a very easier way to reduce dispute. Okay, the last part of my presentation today is how IP will affect business. I believe I have touched some of my points in my earlier presentation. I have mentioned how it affects your businesses, but I will give you a key consideration for business decision for the point for the sake of business decision. Yeah. So it gives exploitation rights. That is a that is a given. It gives you it gives you rights to exploit your trademark, your copyright to the exclusion of another. That is how it affects your businesses. If you don't register your trademark, you don't have the exploitation rights, and you have to deal with any potential infringer with a very troublesome mat with in a very troublesome way if you don't register trademarks or uh, if you don't have a valid contract involved to to distinguish or determine who is who is who, who owns how many shares, who how many shares on the trademark. Why I mentioned contract? Because the moment you file in a trademark or you file in a copyright, if you do not have a contract behind, because the registry wouldn't care less what you have um, decided among yourself, it is automatic rights that how no matter how many proprietors or how many applicants is on a trademark registration or copyright registration, they all own equal rights. So unless it is, be, it is being stated otherwise by another contract. So this is why I mentioned contract, okay? It gives you competitiveness because nowadays uh consumer is very wise and the generation is getting younger and younger all the younger generation they are very very eager and they're very eager to know that whether this particular brand is registered whether this brand is come from a valid source whether this is a counterfeit this i'm for example i would really really search every time i purchase a product i would go through uh, if a brand doesn't appear it's not familiar to me i would go through the uh, wipo to look for the trademark see how long is the company involved that is actually my 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 style now i actually would check the product it actually is a registered trademark or not okay it gives you a competitiveness in terms of uh, market value and why okay this is actually to avoid potential infringement. That's, that's a very obvious explanation. If you don't have a registration involved and someone else came and tell you, I have registered before you, that means you are at risk of infringement. And that means you also need to U-turn whatever you have been doing. You need to create a new trademark. That's for sure because you don't want to infringe anybody else. Okay. And also it encourages innovation. It encourages innovation in a way that um, when someone else sees you, being successful in a particular business, people will tend to copy you. For those who are, for those entrepreneurs, they would, younger entrepreneurs, they would copy, they were trying to imitate you, how you do your business. So it also encourage innovation, but this is not encouraging copying. Yeah, I'm mentioning encouraging innovation, not encouraging copying of your trademark or your copyright. Yeah, so do, do, do bear in mind that my, what I actually meaning here. Okay, and we also have a strategic utility, utilization. Basically, you need to, um, the moment you got your mark re uh, registered, you can actually strategize how you're going to utilize it 
to get more profit from your trademark, like by renting it out or by licensing it out, uh, or even um, I think basically that's it. Like, by licensing out, you need to get a you can and return you get a royalty for it. That is also a strategic utilization because one single person or one single proprietor owner, they cannot do all those branches alone. You need to have partners. And how are you going to look for partners if you don't have a registered trademark? You intend to franchise it or intend to license it. You also need a registered trademark in order to do it, which in turn income generating. All of those are additional income for you. You're renting your license, your trademark out every for a fee, for a licensing fee. On top of the licensing fee, you also get a monthly remuneration. We call them as commission or royalty, depending on what route you're going. If you're going for licensing, you'll get a remuneration or commission. If you go for the franchise, you get a royalty. Also, you also improve your market value in terms of if you in terms of if you go for a public listing, if exam, for example, you want to list your company publicly. So these are all the reasons why and how it affects your businesses if you have a a nice portfolio of intellectual property under your belt. Okay, the last two of for today of my presentation is I will not going. Uh, I'm really loving the new hack so far because it actually gives criminal liability under the uh, for offenses under Section ninety nine to one hundred eight of the new act is basically punishing counterfeit false application of registered trademark false entries. Basically, you are basically. Falsely entering a trademark which does not belong to you. You are importing or selling falsely applied trademark. You are falsely representing you are a registered trademark. All these are offenses granted by the new Trademarks Act, which is also a good thing to actually safeguard the interest of any trademark owners because you can straight away go and lodge a perish report. And this particular fellow is uh, in, uh, it's not infringing. It's counterfeiting my 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 product. It's actually not. It's not cool. And I'm trying. To, I wanted to. Well, I want him caught, and I want him. I want to put him in jail. So it's actually possible now under the new act. So previously, um, if you find someone copying you, can only sue him to court under on the civil manner under the commercial court, and you can only sue him for damages, but you cannot put him in jail. But now this is a possible route to go for. So here is a. The uh, basic idea for in terms of offenses. All right, I believe that's it. I have concluded my my presentation, and I hope everybody enjoys it and didn't bore the death out of you. And and I will pass the pass my control to Zoe. Is it? Thank you, Anthony. Hi. So uh, we will proceed with our second session. So I'll pass the control to Dr. Marcus. Hi, Dr. Marcus. Hi. Hi, everyone. Can you see my slides and hear yes. me? Yes. Yes. Loud and clear. Okay, great. Okay, wow. Well, welcome to the most complicated part of the intellectual property. So, I'm going to talk <laughs> about patents and industrial design. So, okay, it's patent and industrial design, it's more complicated than uh, trademark and copyright for sure because they're more technical but i'm not going to dwell into the technical aspect so we'll stick to the basics yeah be cool okay before i begin who needs a toilet break you can click the raise hand button if you need one let's see okay now we shall proceed okay i was a researcher for many years back then uh one of the problem with researchers is that um we do research a lot of time, but we do not have the eyesight or the vision to realize our invention if there is or bring it to commercialization. So in a company, for example, if you have an R&D team, it, there needs to be people, not just researchers, but people with the vision to bring these uh, things, their inventions into realization. But I'm not going to go around you know, asking people to file to get a patent or industrial design. First, we need to look at the need. Yeah, putting aside complaints, addressing complaints, you know, managing people, your human resources. Very often, uh, uh, startup owners or company owners 
they look into the business objectives like uh, succession, uh, the skills within the company, their KPI, and how to improve the quality of their product and services. So very often when you look into improving quality, there will be new ideas and innovations. This leads to new technology, right? So when you have new technology, you will have then have to look into the finance part, you know, like how to make a profit out of your uh, new technology. Hey, hey, come on, we are not Elon Musk who gave out uh, the Tesla's patents, or we are not saints who created something and say, hey, go around and say, uh, I created this, let's, uh, let me share with you for free, you know? Because um, very often we want to make the most out of our invention and get ROI back from our R&D, right? So apart from making profit, we need to know how to make money and at the same time, reducing wastage because of this new technology. Because getting a patent not just help you to make profit, but you have to spend money annually to keep them maintained, to maintain them. So all of these will actually, you know, go into your budgeting and stuff, right? So we have to really assess the needs, whether first we need a patent, we need an industrial design and how we're going to make use of it. Okay, so now if you have a new technology, right, or an invention or a new design, yeah, you want to look into getting it uh, patented, you know, or getting an industrial design. So what do you get out of this thing? Yeah, so patents, the, the, the protection that we so-called user, we commonly use this term protection, protect. What is the protection? It gives you an exclusive right to stop people or deter people from making, selling, distributing, or even stocking to sell, yeah? Using and importing their inventions within the territory covered by the patent during the period of protection. Why territory? Because patent is also an asset to your company, right? It's an asset, but it's unlike a physical property. It is, uh, you use it like a physical property, but you cannot touch it or you cannot see it. For example, if you have a house, yeah, you can prevent people from intruding into your house right where your house is. There is a location for your house. But for an invention, it can be created here and get stolen and copied elsewhere. So how do you claim that this is your property, right? So you have to get your invention recognized in those territories. This is by registering, by getting a patent. Yeah, and bearing in mind, patents, industrial designs, they are not freehold. They are not forever. In general, most of the countries give 20 years of protection for patents. For industrial design, it's generally shorter. For example, 10 years, uh, 15 years. In Malaysia, it's uh, initially five years, but extendable up to 25 years. So what exactly is the main difference between patent and industrial design? So in some countries, they call patent and as invention patent, like Anthony mentioned just now, and industrial design, they also call it a patent, but it's a design patent, right? But in my talk, I will distinguish them very clearly, yeah? patent, industrial design. So patent protects how your invention works, right? Taking an example, just now Anthony also showed an iPhone, right? So if an iPhone has a touchscreen technology, a fingerprint sensor, those are the functional feature in their products. So patent protects such functional features and also the process, meaning the method to make these features and to use these features if they are new in the world. On the other hand, industrial design or ID we call in short, they protect another part, the phone, the shape of the phone. This is aesthetic, you know, not functional. Just the appearance, the phone shape, the layout, the configuration, or the ornamentation part, the graphical user interface, how the buttons are laid, you know, all these things. So if you have a product having a function and appearance, 
So how? Do you choose which one to protect? The answer is no. You can protect both patents and industrial design for the same product if you have them. Let me show you another, another example. Yeah. So any of you can recognize this product, what this product is. You can type in the chat box if you want. OK, they, these are, all of these are products of Dyson. OK, I think Dyson is pretty famous now. Right? Most of us know. Dyson first came out. This, uh, the founder is called James Dyson. He patented a technology on cyclone air circulation technology. And then he actually won the lawsuit back in the uh, early 2000s. Then he got the money and he started a company called Dyson. So with this cyclone airflow technology, he came up with different applications products. Then he has many product designs. You see, first you have a handheld vacuum cleaner and then a hand dryer and then a bladeless fan. Later on, a robotic uh, vacuum, I presume, and then a hair dryer. So you see, from the same technology, he came up with different products for different applications having different product design and hence many different industry design. Okay. Similarly, vice versa, if you have a similar product design, but the product has different function, different technology in it, like a phone, then you will have a product that has multiple patents. Understood so far? So, The next question we normally get is that how long does it take for me to actually get a, a patent? A patent is a quite tedious uh, uh, process among all of the intellectual property because you have to write a patent document first uh, to describe how your invention works in words and in diagrams. So usually it takes one to three months. I'm just giving a typical time frame. Why one to three months so big gap? Because it really depends on how complicated your invention is, how you describe, and uh, how the communication is between you and your agent to actually work this uh, document out. And once you have the document, submitting the application is quite fast. It's the matter of hours to days. And after submission, your invention or your application is known as patent pending and at pending stage. And you can actually uh, promote or label it this way. Then when, when it's in the patent pending stage, uh, you have to wait for about two to five years. This is quite long. For the patent office, uh, every country will have a centralized government office called the intellectual property or patent office to actually examine your application, whether it is allowable for a patent, whether it is new in the world, it is uh, uh, inventive enough and can be applied in the industry. So. Uh, why, again, why this gap is so huge, two to five years? It really depends on your field of technology. Is it really common that uh, a lot of documents or patents is out there for very exhaustive uh, examination? And it also depends on the territory, how efficient the uh, patent office is. That's why it depends on country, two to five years in general. Yeah. And if you get an objection, you will get a chance to actually uh, respond to the objection, you know, to amend your patent a bit. If you don't get an objection or if you pass, you will uh, be allowed, granted. So typically from the notice that you are being allowed a patent, it will take about a few months for you to get certificates like this. So uh, many uh, different countries have their version of certificates. So I just pick those of the US, China, and Malaysia to you know to show you how uh, typically it looks like. For industrial design, the process is actually much cheaper and shorter because you don't have to write, write a lengthy document, but you have to prepare drawings of the design because it protects the appearance, right? So uh, to prepare the documents, uh, it will take around few years, a uh, few days, sorry, few days to weeks. Why again up to weeks, you know? Because it depends on whether the angles, the views you provided, is it okay? Um, is it sufficient? Uh, does it need any editing? 
and does it uh, can it pass the requirement of the registry? So all of this really depends. Then once you have the drawings ready, then submitting the application is also the matter of hours or days. So after you submit, again, it's industrial design pending. Yeah, it's industrial design pending, and it takes about few weeks to a year to get it examined or granted. Why a few weeks to a year? It also depends on the uh, intellectual property of this of the country, how efficient they are. Yeah. So uh, the industrial design certificate pretty much looks the same like those of the pattern. It's just that the content will specify that it is a uh, industrial design. I don't. I'm not sure whether you can see here. Akta Reka Bento Industrial here. Wai Guan Shiji. Over here is a grant of a patent. Uh, Fa Ming Zhuan Li. Oh. Then people start asking, wow, the time is so long. So what can I do while I wait? Yeah. Actually, before grant, uh, you do not have the solid right to the patent or industrial design, but you have some sort of provisional protection before grant. Provisional protection means you can actually warn any potential infringer. Uh, requesting them to cease their uh, use of your invention, or you can actually license out your pending patent uh, with the promise that you will continue to prosecute them. Yeah. Then only after grant, of course, after grant, you can still continue to warn them. You can also request for compensation. Yeah, compensation for the infringement because of the loss caused by the infringement. Sometimes up to back to the time when the infringement took place before grant itself. Then uh, very likely both the parties will go into negotiation, like mediation, you know, to sort out the terms, you know, the compensation, whether they agree or not that they infringe, all these things. And if mediation doesn't work, sometimes they go into sue and counter sue, like how Apple and Samsung fight each other, sue and counter sue. So if you don't intend to use your patent at all, you may just choose to sell it, meaning assign it to another party. Then you will transfer your ownership. You no longer own it, and another person who bought it will own it. But if you have the intention to use it, you and you would like to let other people to use it while earning money, you can also license out. So all of these are what we call the offensive strategy. You use patents or industrial design like a sword in your business whereby this with this strategy you can warn people ask for compensation initiate litigation but i would also say patent is also a shield it's a sword and a shield because nowadays defensive strategies have become more and more famous whereby you use it to defend yourself if people who usually sue you are those of your competitor in a similar field right so you have your patent, he has his own patent. What happens is when he sue you, you counter sue, like the Apple and Samsung case. They sue each other. Sometimes Apple wins, sometimes Samsung wins. So because they have their own portfolio. And getting a patent, one of the criteria is that, just now I mentioned, it has to be novel and inventive, right? So there must be something special about your product. So Get, having a patent portfolio will let people actually think twice when they want to attack you. Yeah. So if you do not have a sword, how, how do you go and attack people? And if you do not have a shield, how do you defend yourself when you are being attacked? Yeah. So in summary, yeah, you can see um, you can actually, with the patent, you can actually choose to use the invention for yourself and to stop people from doing it. You can also choose to license out, make it available to other people to use it and earn money out of it. Or you can sell it, transfer it away totally. Yeah, with this. So this is from the quite legal perspective what you can do. But in a larger scope uh, marketing sense, actually you can do more instead of just using it as a sword and a shoe. So you can see in a business, when you analyze your strength, your uh, weaknesses, your 
opportunities, your threats. The intellectual property can fit into these elements when you consider your strengths, your weaknesses, and so on. But I'm not going to go into the, the SWOT analysis because this is not a business talk. But I'm just going to share a bit on how you use it in your strategy. So for example, I've mentioned just now, you can self-exploit it and uh, prevent other people from using it if you have the capability to work out your invention, right? Because you want to, to be the exclusive maker or the seller. And you also want to stand out from your competitors and then to, to you know, kind of like, uh, if they infringe on you, you really want to take action because you don't want to make unnecessary loss. And um, you also want to make your competitors kind of fear you if they want to copy or attack you, you see? So this is how uh, uh, promoting your patent portfolio can help you deter these competitors. So at the same time, if you were to work the inventions yourself, you may want to consider use it as a branding or marketing tool. Later, I will show you some examples of Starbucks, who is a famous company who's very good in using not just their own Starbucks brand, but their patent labeling in their branding. So it's like value adding to, to their product. So that's why their coffee or merchandises, they actually sell really, really high price, not just because of their own branding, but also because they're of their patenting marketing. Yeah, later I will show you some examples. Uh, you may also want to consider expanding your market share with your patents and industrial design. Sometimes um, when you cover a certain region and not the other region, you would want to expand your market to sell it to other people in other region or other parts of the world if you have patent in those spaces. So what happens is, like I said just now, you can find people in your field. So in this sense, they are not competitors, but they are business partners. So you may want to license it out to them so that they can produce or they can even sell it in those places. So indirectly, you're actually expanding your market share already and uh, profiting, profiting from this income because when they sell it, you get royalty from how many they sell or how many they produce. Yeah. Or if you do not have the production facility, for example, yeah, you engage an OEM manufacturer to produce your, your customized or so-called invention. And as we know, OEM usually they also produce for other parties. So you do not want your invention to be licked by dishonest people. So what happens is that um, very often we advise clients to actually sign a confidentiality agreement with the OEM producers, but a uh, confidentiality agreement is not foolproof. Sometimes you will also feel insecure. Like what if they do it behind your back? And then how are you going to prove that they breached the confidentiality agreement? Yeah. So usually we will advise then to add another layer of insurance by patenting it. You tell your OEM that this is patented, you know, be careful, don't simply leak my invention. And with a patent, you don't even need to prove that they breach the confidentiality because once the product is found to be copied in bad faith and not coincidence, then you can actually take action. So it's kind of like another layer of insurance for your own confidence, yeah? And also funding. Nowadays, many countries, the government of many countries, they actually provide uh, fundings and government grants for R&D, product development, innovation. You know, even Malaysia also gives a lot of this kind of funding for even for startups or established companies, as long as they develop new technologies. It doesn't have to be a rocket science stuff, uh, but things that are innovative. So you can apply for funding. So many of uh, a lot of times, these kind of funding bodies, they require or they encourage uh, the commercialization prospect of your innovation. And one of the proof is that you will need to have a patent application number to show that uh, this is prospective for a commercialization. I will show you some example later as well. And finally, last but not least, is uh, to assure your investors and stakeholders because when you have a patent portfolio, it's kind of like uh, an asset 
and it shows that you stand out in the market. And it's also a valuable asset when you evaluate your property, when you want to go for IPO and stuff like that. So it assures them that you are at a good standing in terms of your technological advantage and your market advantage. And you also make use of this advantage to attract new investors as well because you stand out with having all these things, right? So let me show you some of the examples. Let's just now I've mentioned branding marketing. I promise to show you example of Starbucks. Okay, looking at the very far left, this is a, a cup sleeve, the paper sleeve. Now this is very common. This was patented back in uh, 1980s or 90s, yeah? A very simple thing, even a paper sleeve, you see, is patented and uh, by Starbucks. And then actually it's patented by another company, but uh, Starbucks acquired the rights to it. It's how this thing is configured to fold and then expand and slide into the, into the cup. And you have corrugations for you to hold it tightly. Yeah, and at the same time, uh, prevent getting scalded by a hot cup. So this thing is patented and Starbucks actually put the labeling, how you do it in your product. Uh, there is no specific rules on how you should label your status, but you have to be honest. You cannot falsely misrepresent. If you don't apply for a patent, you cannot say you have a patent. This is against the law. But if you really have a patent, how you label it is up to you. Like in this sleeve, right, Starbucks put patent, they put a website here. You can go to the website and check their portfolio. But people who look at it will know that they have a patent on this thing. Now this patent has been expired. So a lot of people is using this already. That day I was, even a simple toilet roll has patent how it was invented back then into a roll and it has a perforations for you to pull nicely. Right? That day I was doing a short video about it. We were laughing so hard <laughs> because it's toilet paper, yeah. Something as simple innovation like this are actually patentable as long as it is new at the point of the time that you file for patent. So this is a functional product that got a patent. What about this cup? It's not so much functional, it's more of the design. You see the mermaid tail of Starbucks. Starbucks mascot is a mermaid, right? So this design is actually patented design. So at this point, they label it Patent pending, yeah, patent pending. Uh, it's a uh, hot stamp behind the cup, you can see. So this is uh, industrial design. And if you look at Starbucks coffee, uh, the coffee packaging, you see, huh? Even a uh, nutrition can be patented. No, they, this one, they got the patent already. So it's a patent number, you see, US patent. If you have a worldwide patent, you don't have to list the whole uh, different countries number, you can actually say worldwide patent granted or worldwide patent pending. Yeah, so he listed out here. This is a patent not on the product, but on the method to make their beverage, their coffee more aromatic, enhanced flavor. So you see method can only can also be protected if they are special new. So he labeled it here, you see. So you print this, these are the examples of product, functional product, uh, method, patented, and then industrial design. Okay, so I also want to squeeze something that is not Starbucks. This is a Rolex watch. This is how you see Starbucks, they printed their stuff. You can also engrave it. This is how Rolex engrave patent pending behind the watch on the metal itself. So this is uh, for a diver, a watch for a diver. So it has a special valve for compressed gas who went into the watch to come out. So Rolex actually have a patent pending back then on this and they engrave it on their product. Yeah. So finish about branding. Just now I was, I, I talk about funding as well. So this is an example of a website screen cap from Idana Mosti, Ministry of Science and Technology. Malaysia. So they have these three kinds of funds for technology readiness at level two, four, 
2447. So these funds, they would require or encourage uh, IP protection in order to obtain these funds because they encourage the technology development to the point that uh, it can be commercialized and realized, you see. So technology readiness, so when can you actually file these patents of industrial design? Basically for uh, technology, there are nine levels of readiness before the product actually went from just principle to concept and solidify into a, a prototype and then validation, how it works, how, how feasible it is up to the product is ready for marketing. For some technology like uh, uh, pharmaceutical, from technology readiness level TRL 1 to 9 is pretty slow. But for some technology like computer, from level one to level nine, it's pretty fast. You know, developing uh, depending on the nature of the technology as well. So usually, people file and people are encouraged to file for patent or industrial design at this stage t between TRL two to TRL four. You don't need to have a complete workable product, but as long as you have the prototype or the blueprint that can uh, actually be shown to be workable. You know, it doesn't have to be something rocket science. Okay, and it also cannot be something like a time machine that is unbelievable as long as the examiner can believe that this thing can work and you have a, a basic prototype or a blueprint around TRL 2 to 4 before you actually market or launch a product you can actually file for patent ready because bearing in mind it takes some time before your patent gets granted, right? So after filing it, then you can be rest assured to launch your product. Yeah, so this is the end of my talks. I hope uh, after hearing this, uh, it gives you an idea for you guys to go back and think, you know, uh, whether you need a patent or industrial design, how you intend to use it, whether you are ready to, you know, to, to, to uh, employ these strategies. Yeah, so that's it for today. Thank you very much. So I will pass this back to our host, Zoe. Thank you once again. Thank you, Dr. Marcus. So um, we were going to begin our Q&A sessions. So as a reminder, you can still submit your question through the meeting chat. So we'll go through the first question. So our first question from Gareth Leung. So how long can we put TM up for? Oh, I think. I... Um, so this question, um, I think Anthony will be, can answer the question. Um, hello, Anthony. Zoe, can you unmute Anthony? Um, I think we can. Yeah. Um, so just one moment. Um, sorry, I think there is some technical issues in here. So how about Marcus, can you um, answer this question? Let me see again. Right. So, how um, long can we put the TM up? Actually, you can put it as long as you want up to... Uh, Anthony, correct me if I'm wrong. You can put it as long as you want up to the point it is being successfully registered. So as long as you have, you have the intention to use the trademark and say that it's yours, you know, you kind of like claim that it's yours, you put the word TM, but you cannot use the word R until it is successfully registered. 
So only after you get the, 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 the usually we say after the certificate, then you can change your the TM to R in circle. Thank you. So we'll go for a second question from Ku Kajun. So it's best to start a brand with a non-proper word, for example, the Dusto Absolute. <laughs> Anthony still cannot, cannot, still cannot unmute that. Yeah, so <laughs> okay. Anthony can type your answer here and then I'll okay. read out for you. As long as we, I'll wait for him to re-log in. Okay, um, <laughs> actually it's very good to have invented words. I think from uh, what Anthony showed just now, it's very good to invent your own word. Uh, I wouldn't say it's non-proper, it's still proper. But you invent your own word by mixing it and it doesn't directly reflect what you are showing meaning if you sell pampers you don't call your trademark as pampers so this is invented and it's uh, distinctive so this is good yeah uh did i answer your question Kajun? okay so yeah i think so you can move on to the next okay, question okay so i'll move on to the third question by stephanie so if I am creating a software for accounting and project management, what is your advice? Oh, I think this falls under patent. Okay, <laughs> all right. Okay, usually a software, uh, I'm not talking about the algorithm behind it because algorithm per se is not patentable, but it's copyrightable as a piece of artwork. But regarding how the software function, we get more and more software nowadays. Uh, how your software functions at the back end, the flows, the modules that you created to fun, uh, to make the software works, how they perform calculation, you know, and what module after what module. Okay, so this entire flow and components, they are patentable. Yeah, because it's functional. So as long as this software is not something that is uh, common, like the UPS system you just copy, then you cannot. So it has to have something new and inventive behind your software in terms of its functional feature. Then you can opt for a patent. And with regards, if your software, you have special graphical user interface, okay, you can actually register it under industrial design protection. Or if you deem it as a very artistic piece of work. It can actually go for copyright as well. Right? Did I answer your question, Stephanie? Okay. So I'll move to the next question. So by Frank Hall, may I know all those websites that have all rights reserved, any use in law protection? So, Anthony, are you able to unmute yourself? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no worries, you can just type your reply. I'll read out for you. Uh, those are for copyright purpose. Uh, it is basically a symbol to warn the viewer that the web page is protected by copyright. Okay, so I hope that answers the question. So it looks like we have covered all the questions. So Anthony and Dr. Marcus, is there anything else you both would like to cover before we wrap up the session? No, oh, I'm cool. <laughs> Anthony. <laughs> So Marcus, you represent Anthony to answer. Anthony says, no, I have no more questions. <laughs> okay, so um, thank you, Anthony, Dr. Marcus, and everyone for attending today's event. So if you have any question, you can still email me at admin liarscasinternational.net. On behalf of CAS International Network Limited and our presenter, thank you for joining us today. Stay safe and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.